But sometimes we have older folks that will just bag out of service or say, well, I'm going to let the younger generation. She's not doing that. So what excuse do we have? How can we find a reason not to do that? Thankful for the testimony. Certainly thankful for the song. Again, sorry for the allergies this morning. Those of you on the platform, you can find your place in the auditorium. Thank you very much for that. The song is about paradoxes, and I think it fits so well with the message this morning. I'm thankful for whenever the Lord does that, because we're back in the Sermon on the Mount, and Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 4 is where we will be today. And we're reading about another one of those paradoxes that Jesus gives to us in living the Christian life. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be a disciple? Well, there's some things that He gives us that here's what it looks like. If you're a disciple, this is what's going to be evident or, or truthful in your life. If you find Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 4, if you're physically able, if you'll stand with me, we'll just read one verse and then pray and get into the message this morning. Matthew chapter number 5. In fact, we'll just read, we'll begin reading in verse number 1, but our focus will be verse number 4. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. I'm going to speak this morning on the subject, happy are the unhappy. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your word. Please help us to learn from it. Please, Lord, help these traits to be found in our life, not just picking out one or two of them. Lord, thinking that we're doing well by doing that. Lord, every single one of these beatitudes should be in our life. Please help us to realize that. And then, Lord, where we are lacking, please help us to ask for your help and strength. And Lord, we'll be careful to thank you for it. Lord, maybe there's someone here today that isn't saved. That is, they don't know Christ as their personal Savior. Then please, please do what I can not and convict them of their sin. Show them they're a sinner, just like everyone else in this room, like everyone else in the world. And then, Lord, help them to understand the free gift of salvation you want to give to them. And, Lord, pray that today might be the day of their salvation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. You ever met somebody that isn't happy unless they're unhappy? Now, I know that's probably no one in here. I'm, I'm certain of it. But you probably have met somebody like I have that just, it doesn't seem like they're happy unless they're unhappy. You know, those people that you, they don't smile unless you flip them upside down. And then they finally have a smile on their face. Maybe you've met somebody like this. Again, I know this is no one in here. I'm sure it's nobody in here. But there's people in our lives that if there's not enough unhappiness or there's not enough stuff to be mad about, then they'll drum up their own drama in order to be unhappy. I've met a few people like that. It's not fun to be around those kind of people. I have uh, blessings, little children, um, now that are growing up to be bigger children, but when they were younger, and I hate to say it, but even when they're now older, there are times when, um, you know, we will have a discussion with them and they will, especially when they were younger, they put out the pouty lip. Anybody ever uh, remember that when kids put out the no, I'm supposed to be mad. And then you, you know, because children are given naturally to laughter, I think, and so you stick out your tongue at them or you make a face at them. And they can't keep the frown on their face, you know, they're, they're trying with all their might to be mad and frustrated about what you're telling them to do, and they just can't because, well, I can't stay mad. I mean, you know, but we as adults, we tend to keep the pouty face. And we're better at hiding the pouty lip, but our attitude just isn't what it needs to be. There are people that are like that. And, and you ever sat next to somebody in church that they want to enjoy church and they want to they chuckle in church like some of you this morning? They want to chuckle and have fun, but they just, they're not going to let themselves do that? <laughs> yeah, I've met a few of those too. In fact, I may be looking at a couple of them uh, this morning. <laughs> now, we can laugh a little bit about that and we understand, well, that's silly. Why? Who's, who's happy to be unhappy? But we come to verses like Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 4, and as we just kind of read over it, we think, man, that doesn't make sense. Blessed are they that mourn, 
for they shall be comforted. And if we thought verse number three was a paradox, boy, we really are even more so blown over by the, the truth of verse number four. It, it's more shocking to us, I guess we could say. And as we read the verse, it doesn't, again, it doesn't seem to make sense. In fact, it's doing the exact opposite. It, it says the exact opposite of the perspective of the world that you and I live in today. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't, that's not what the world tells us to do. And I think as I read verses like this, I, I think that most people, most of us here this morning, we really want to be happy. There's, there's not really, I would hope, nobody in here that just simply says, man, I really love Morning, I love being sad and being frustrated. I just, I love to have that happen in my life. I hope none of us in here are like that. I think we, we want to be genuinely happy. And it's, it's, if there's one thing that the world tries to get us to not be, it's miserable. The world tells us, and in fact, many of us kind of buy into this fact that if I feel miserable, if I feel unhappy, if I'm, if I'm frustrated about something, or if, even if I'm mourning something, then the best bet for me is to get rid of my mourning, get, to get rid of my frustration, to, to do some, something, some activity, some, some action, be involved in something that, that gets me to not think about my mourning and gets me to Forget about that and, and leave that to the side and to do something else that makes me happy. In fact, every advertisement that you will see, every piece of advice that you might get, every conversation seems to be about our current suffering and how many days till vacation till I get to get out of my current suffering. Boy, when I get to the beach, when I get to this hotel, when I get to do this activity, get up in the mountain, whatever, then I'll really be happy. I'll be able to get away from it all. And in our way of thinking, we, we seem to have this understanding that the way to happiness is to have things going our way. That's what many people would tell us. And for many people, favorable things, favorable life brings happiness, but unfavorable things bring unhappiness. But notice again, verse 4, what Jesus says. Blessed... And the word literally is happy. Eternal happiness or, or heavenly happiness, supreme happiness, are they that mourn. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's almost like, well, wait a minute, that's not even true. Now, listen to what Jesus says. Luke puts it another way in Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 25. Here, listen to what he says. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. In other words, what Jesus is doing in this sermon is He's turning the world's principles upside down. And the way that the world thinks about things, Jesus is saying, no, that is not the truth of the matter. And now we re need to remind ourselves as we kind of get back into this Sermon on the Mount that there's a reason why Jesus begins with verse number 3. Right? There's a reason why he doesn't just give these, these truths haphazardly. He begins with verse number three for a reason. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right? As he begins to lay out these beatitudes, there's a reason why they're in this order. They, they build on one another. Okay. So also what I need to be reminded of is these beatitudes, what does that mean? Well, a simple way to understand them is... These attitudes are attitudes that should be your attitude. I should be, first of all, poor in spirit. Does that mean I go around with a frown on my face and, and feeling sorry for myself? No. The issue there in verse number three literally is humility. I should not be lifting myself up. I should be poor in spirit, realizing that I cannot please God in any other way than if I humble myself. I realize I can't do anything to save myself. I can't do anything to live the Christian life. I'm powerless to do that. So I have to become poor in spirit. And when I become poor in spirit and realize that I am a filthy, rotten, nasty sinner, and I can't do anything to save my soul, but realize that, chapter 5, verse number 3, that Jesus can and I put my trust in Him in humility, then the Bible says, 
then you understand that yours is the kingdom of heaven. Humble yourself, confess your sins, trust Christ. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. These are things that should be my attitude. So now, then again, verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, these are not... Uh, these beatitudes are not ingredients that make up my salvation. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek. If I'll do these things, then I can be saved. No. The issue is salvation is of Christ, and I trust Him for my salvation. These are attitudes that would come to bring me to Christ, not earning my way to Him. And verse 3 is the perfect beginning, the foundation for the remaining beatitudes humbling ourselves, realizing I'm not in any way powerful enough to save myself before I'm able to understand that Christ is completely able to give me perfect righteousness. And remember, that's what the theme of the Sermon on the Mount is, perfect righteousness. You can look at verse number 20 again and be reminded of that. Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. The issue is righteousness. Well, how do I get righteousness? Glad you asked. It comes through humility. Verse 4, it comes when I will mourn. Okay, so am I talking about physical mourning here or are we talking about something else? Well, verse 3 is not being poor physically. It's not being in poverty. Remember, it's poor in spirit. So if verse 3, we're talking about spiritual matters, then doesn't it make sense that verse 4, we're also talking about spiritual matters? This is spiritual in nature. And all of these beatitudes are spiritual in nature. A spiritual condition rather than a physical condition. Okay, so then preacher, what does verse number 4 mean? Well, I think there's two aspects to it. And so we just want to talk about those this morning. Number one. Mourning, in verse number 4, is a proper response to my sin. Mourning is a proper response to my sin. So the mourning that Jesus talks about here in chapter number 5 and verse number 4 is not the sorrow of like loss or bereavement. I lost a loved one or I lost something that was close to me and so I begin to mourn. That's not what we're talking about here in verse number 4. Now, Let's take a time out real quick. Does Jesus offer comfort to those who will mourn the loss of a loved one? Yes, certainly. There's no question about that. But that's not what he's talking about here in Matthew chapter number 5. The issue is, verse 3, humble yourself. You humble yourself, you're able to receive salvation. And once you humble yourself and realize that you are worthless to be able to do anything about your own sin... Then comes verse number 4. I realize how my sin has brought a separation between me and a holy God. And verse number 4, I begin to mourn over that fact. That I can't do anything in and of myself to gain salvation. To, to do anything to, to have my sin forgiven in my life. I can't do anything about that. So, verse 4, blessed are they who are upset about that. You're mourning your sin, the separation that your sin has brought between you and God. What is Jesus referring to with this mourning and anguish? That it bothers you. It, I mourn because I have sin in my life. And if I think about it like this, then, then I understand, okay, if I'm mourning, I'm weeping, literally, I'm, I'm Weeping over the sin in my life. You, you think that I'm taking it seriously? You better believe it. I'm, I'm taking the sin in my life seriously. I'm mourning over the fact that I'm a sinner. And as I'm, I'm studying for this message, and I'm throughout the week, I'm just thinking of the life of our church here at Forbes, on, on Forbes. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Trinity Baptist Church. And I'm thinking about each one of you. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the future of our church and the ministries of our church. And, and in doing so, I have to evaluate, okay, so where are we are now physically? Where are we, are, uh, where are we at uh, practically? But I also have to include where are we at spiritually? 
If we're going to see us as a church reach the lost of our city and, and get out and engage and make a difference in this city that God has put us in, then I have to think, okay, so where am I spiritually with my God? And I'm brought to the place often to where it seems like in our church and, and like so many other churches just like us, there can be a defective, if you, we want to use that word, a defective sense of sin. And I think it can come from a defective doctrine of sin. Now by that, I don't mean that we believe wrongly about what sin does, but we just don't live like we believe it is. We don't believe on a practical level the truth of what the Bible says about sin because we can be found, if we're like many other churches just like us, we can be found mocking our sin. We can be found not taking our sin seriously. We can be found, uh, you know, just kind of making light of it or, or just kind of excusing it rather than doing what Jesus is telling us to do here in verse number 4. Blessed are they that mourn. We, we are not weeping over our sin. Um, <laughs> this is silly. This is the platform. I don't think I'm blowing anybody's mind here. This is the platform. But when it comes time to invitation, this is turned into an altar where I come and I present my needs before my God. To where I come when God is working on my heart about something that's in my life, I come and I bring that to Him. I mourn over my sin. Now, this is silly. Just stay with me, all right? You know what these are? <laughs> these are Kleenexes. Um, well, they're not even Kleenex brand. They're facial tissues, sorry. Um, now, here, here's an example, all right? And please, don't misunderstand. I'm not getting on anybody. I, I want us to think through this. This tissue box still has a bit of a seal that's not been broken. It means no one's really needed to take one of these in a while. Because we really haven't been mourning over stuff that's going on in our life. Now again, I'm not trying to drag anybody down to the altar. I want you to think though. When was the last time that I spent some time mourning over the sin in my own life? I'm not talking about my neighbor's sin. I'm not talking about the sin of the world. I'm talking about you and me individually. I have sinned against a holy God. And what Jesus is trying to get His disciples to understand is here, blessed are the poor in spirit. You humble yourself and realize you're a sinner and you can't do anything about it. And so that ought, verse 4, drive you to mourn about that fact. To feel bad about, I can't do anything to bring myself closer to God in and of myself. Someone has to do that for me. And when I humble myself and realize that, then yours is the kingdom of heaven. You realize what it is to be saved. You confess your sin and agree with God about it. And then you turn to Him for salvation and Him alone. Not getting baptized. Not in giving in the offering. Now those are all good things to do. But those come in obedience because I have been saved. Not to earn me salvation. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. If I laugh at my sin, I cannot be taking it seriously. But when I mourn over my sin, I'm realizing that sin affects me personally. I read this quote, I thought it was good. To choose to sin is to choose to suffer. When I choose to engage in sinful activity, whatever that might be, whether that's just the, the, the thoughts that no one else knows that go on in my mind, you understand I'm choosing to suffer. Because I'm giving that battleground then over to sin. I choose to engage in activity that other people can see. And then I am stupid enough to put it on Facebook. I'm choosing to suffer. 
And I can't very well post my sin on social media and then get mad when somebody confronts me about it. Please don't ask me or somebody else not to judge you when you're the one that's putting it out there. See? Now, oh, who did something? No one did anything. I'm not calling out anybody. I don't get out there enough even to, to look at it. I'm just saying, let's think as a, as a church, how do I live my life? Am I being a disciple of my God in the way that I live my life? What is my belief about sin? Does that cause me to mourn? Does that cause me any trouble at all? Because sin affects my relationship with God and it affects my relationship with other people. You understand my sin doesn't just affect me with God, it affects my relationship with my wife. It affects my relationship with my children. It affects my relationship with my church family. When I choose to engage in sinfulness. And that should, when I realize that, it should bring about sorrow in my life. So what are you saying, preacher? Are you saying we cut out all humor in church? No, no, please don't. You need to smile. Some of you could use a smile right now, in fact. Yeah. No, we need humor in church. But what I'm trying to get us to understand is realize that when I humble myself and realize that I'm spiritually bankrupt and I realize what my sin has done in my relationship to a holy God, it should bring me to the point of mourning and sorrow over my sin. Now, you don't have to turn there, but I want you to just listen to James chapter number 4, verse number 8 through 10. James 4, verses 8 through 10. Now, listen to what James is saying. By the way, who's James writing to? Christian people scattered abroad. Listen to what he says. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Now, to me, that sounds like Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. It sounds exactly what, like what Jesus is saying here. And I can't help but wonder that if in our churches today in general, and, and by the way, preachers can be guilty of this, we make so much of grace that we make light of sin. Now, I want to make sure I'm very well understood on this. Am I thankful for grace? You better believe that I am. Holy smokes. Without grace, I have no reason to even stand before you this morning. We sing the song, Amazing Grace, that saved a wretch like me. I am so amazed at grace. I'm so thankful for God's grace in my life. We ought to choose to celebrate God's grace every day that we take breath. I'm thankful that I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace. But in my desire to celebrate grace... I can bypass or overlook sin because I can start to get the mindset that, well, I can just confess that and everything will be okay. Okay, can I confess my sins and God forgives every one of my sins? Yes, yes, no question about that. But I ought not sacrifice the, the effect that sin has on my life or on your life by just saying, well, it's under grace. I ought not cheapen grace by doing that. I ought to have my sin affect me to the point where it brings me to some mourning. Lord, I am so sorry for the sin that I've committed against you. We've long since left weeping at the altar as, as we realize the weight of our sins and Realizing that we can rise up in joy at the remembrance of the grace that God gives to us. Because the world doesn't get upset about its sin. In fact, the world celebrates its sin. You know how I know? Because I have a television in my home. And I can turn on the television at really any time of the day. And I can see within the first couple of minutes someone joking about sin or making light of sin. I can see it in a movie. I can see it in a television program. And by the way, we've come a long way since Mayberry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now, Opie, tell the truth about killing the bird in the tree. 
We're far from that. Now we're making light of all kinds of wickedness. The world doesn't mourn over its sin. The world is laughing about its sin. In fact, we can make the case that the world has gone to great lengths to try to legalize its sin. Now, I want to take just a minute and, and say this. We can gripe about our country and our city a lot. But you and I need to be also encouraged by good pieces of legislation and good Christian legislators and lawmakers who will take a stand for what is right. We need to be thankful for them. We need to be praying for them. And we need to be praying that God would rise up, raise up more of them. We need to be thankful for those kinds of people. But we also need to understand that where we have allowed ourselves to get to as a nation is that it's still legal in our country to murder infants. It's still legal to do that. We have legalized drug use. We've legalized gambling. Uh, by the way, haven't we all been encouraged to uh, participate in our own Texas lottery? <laughs> And then the guy at the end says, if you struggle with gambling, you need to see whatever. And so our government has taken monies and they've legalized gambling and then they make money off of it, off the backs of its own people. And then they use some of those same monies to come up with institutionalized programs for those that struggle with gambling. Does that not cause anybody any kind of problem? We've legalized things like this. And we've legalized pornography and we call it freedom of expression. We, we legalize homosexual marriage and we could go on and on and on and on, but it's easy for us to stand in a pulpit or to stand out in the foyer and complain about our nation, complain about our city, or complain about all kinds of things, but we need to stop and remind ourselves that lost people act like lost people. I can't expect lost people to act like saved Christian people. So the question then comes when I read Matthew chapter number 5 then, is what is my response? What am I doing personally about my sin? And I'm not saying we shouldn't call out sin in our world or that we shouldn't speak out against certain issues. But let's turn the table and seriously ask, what am I doing about my sin? What is, what is in my life personally that God needs to deal with and I need to confess before Him? Because it's easy for me to, to point fingers. In verse 4, Jesus says, I'm supposed to look at my sin and I should be mourning over my sin. Because it's good for you and for me at the end of the day to pause and evaluate and ask some questions like, what have I done today? What have I said today? What thoughts have gone through my mind today? How have I behaved myself today toward other people? What attitudes have I shown somebody else? The mark of a mature life is not sinlessness. That's reserved for heaven. The mark of a mature life in Christ is a growing awareness of my sinfulness Realizing how much sin I really commit on a daily basis. And realizing I can't do anything to stop that apart from God's grace in my life. I don't just gain salvation or justification by any way through Christ alone. But through Christ alone. I, I gain salvation through Christ and Him alone. But I gain sanctification and awareness of my sin in verse number 4 also by Christ alone. I need His help in my life for salvation. I need His help in my life for sanctification. To grow closer and closer and closer to Him. So I realize my sin, verse 4, and I mourn over it, which should bring me then to the second part of the verse. Glory for second parts of verses. Look at verse number 4. Blessed are they that mourn. Why? For they shall be comforted. 
praise the Lord for the comfort that He gives. So I realize the terribleness of my own sin and how sin has pervaded my life, every, every ounce of my life, and I take that very seriously and I humble myself as God told me to do. I agree with God about my sin and then I turn to Him. Then verse 4 says, I can find comfort from my mourning. I realize that He will give forgiveness. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, verse number 10. Listen to what Paul says. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's two kinds of sorrow there. Godly sorrow and the sorrow of the world. Godly sorrow does a work in my heart. That is a work of repentance. And godly sorrow does not mean mental punishment. It does, it's not me discussing how pathetic I am and how much of a loser I am. It's not me getting out my whip and whipping myself and, 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 and trying to castigate myself because of all the things that I've done. Because all that is doing, if I think about it, if I bring that to its logical conclusion, all that's doing is putting the focus back on me. Well, let me get rid of myself. Let me injure myself. Let me harm myself so that I can feel bad about myself and what my sin is so that then when I'm done feeling bad about myself and I'm done punishing myself, then I'll feel somewhat a little bit better because I suffered a little bit for my sin. Listen, friend. God doesn't call you and me to suffer for our sins. He's put the suffering on His Son. Every bit of wrath for my sin was suffered by Christ on the cross so that I don't have to suffer for my sin. Should I feel sorry for it? You better believe that I should. But the whole focus should not become about me. Godly repentance isn't on me. Say, well, how's it about me? Well, you're thinking about what you did and how bad you are. And what is the center of all that? Uh, the center of all that is you. The focus of godly sorrow is not you. The focus of godly sorrow is Almighty God. He's the standard. He's the one that I'm comparing myself to. And so when he says in verse number 48 of Matthew chapter number 5, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I can't do that! He has to make me to be like Him. And when I humble myself... He said, I'll forgive your sins, child, and I will make you to be righteous, holy in my sight, so that every sin, past, present, future, is forgiven. I don't know about you, but that's comforting to me. Thankful for that fact. And those of us who are Christians, we understand the eternality of our salvation. That is, since I've trusted Christ for salvation... And no part of salvation is up to me, not earned by me, nor is it kept by me. I cannot lose it somehow. But sin does affect my fellowship with my God. Sin does affect my closeness with God. And when I realize what I've done to, to, the, to the heart of God, in breaking fellowship with Him in my sin, it ought to cause, cause me to mourn. It ought to cause me even to weep over that broken relationship. Because worldly sorrow hates just the consequence of sin. Worldly sorrow hates getting caught. Godly sorrow hates the very sin that you've committed. When I'm sorrowful in the Lord, I'm sorrowful for even committing the sin. And when God is my chief concern, I can have the happiness that He mentions here in verse number 4. Blessed, eternally, forever happy are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Because as Jesus says in these paradoxical statements, the negative has to come before the positive. Some of you have gone through surgery. You know what surgery is, really, is you're telling the doctor you're willing to be wounded so that you can be healed. You think about your Christian life, that's exactly what a humble spirit has to say. I'm willing to be wounded. I'm willing to mourn over my sin and feel sorry for it and realize I can't do anything to, to, to help myself. And so I'm willing to be wounded over that. I'm willing to mourn over that so that I can be healed, so that Christ can come and forgive. Every sin, every stain can be blotted away. 
And the idea of godly sorrow is exactly the same. I have to be willing to mourn over my sin that I've committed so that God can come and he can bring me comfort. And I'm telling you, that is exactly contrary to the way that the world we live in understands how I should live my life. They don't want to face their sin. And if you don't face your sin, you'll never experience God's healing and God's grace in your life. So how does it happen? Three quick ways and we're, we're done. Number one, starts with regret. Regret has to do with my mind. I'm remembering what I'm sorry about. Then it continues with remorse. I'm now moving from head level, regret. I'm moving to heart level and remorse. I'm truly remorseful for my sin. And then it finishes with repentance, a change of mind that leads to a change of action. I realize what my sin has done and I agree with God about my sin and I confess it and then I desire to do differently with my life. And this is the place, Matthew 5 verse number 4, this is the place where comfort comes in my life. Blessedness, happiness doesn't come in the morning itself. It doesn't come in my regret and remorse. Comfort comes from God's response when I regret it, I'm remorseful, and I repent of it. That's when God's blessing comes. So verse 3, you recognize your spiritual bankruptcy before God. You experience godly sorrow, verse 4, and then God gives you the joy of becoming clean. And that is the joy that the world knows nothing about. Does God really forgive my sin when I mourn over it and I confess it? Yes. <laughs> There's got to be something else there. No? No? I realize what my sin has done. I regret it and I'm remorseful of it. And then I repent of it. And God says he'll be faithful every time to forgive it. You remember Jesus it begins to preach in his earthly ministry and he is given the scroll and it's amazing how the scroll is, is right at Isaiah chapter number 61. Here's what it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings to the, unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. See, God says, I'm come. I know you're mourning over your sin. I'm come to give you deliverance from that. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 3. Listen to what he says. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. That's who God is. There is such joy and forgiveness that there's wonderful comfort in knowing that, that God will take me back after I have fallen once again. Why I love pastoring. And there's nothing like the joy of seeing salvation come about in somebody's life. I, I love seeing a parent and a child who were at odds with one another get reconciled back together. I love seeing that. I, I love seeing a husband and wife who are struggling and, and fighting. And man, there's some deep valleys. And they're talking about some separation or even divorce. And then they realize, boy... We need to get back to what does the Lord say. And they're reconciled back together. I love seeing that. I love watching when a sinner understands their sinfulness and realizes that God's the only one that can save them and they come to Christ for salvation. I love watching that. And then that sinner does what we might call backsliding or, or going opposite of the way the Lord would have them to go. And God works in their life. And every time that sinner comes back to God, God welcomes them back with open arms. I love seeing that. Boy, relief is available from sorrow. And so Jesus says in Matthew 5, godly sorrow brings forgiveness, which brings, the very first word, blessedness, happiness, joy. 
Verse 4 doesn't make sense when you first read it. See, I want pain-free days. I want worry-free days. But Jesus says exactly the opposite. I'll read you a poem as we conclude. Robert Browning Hamilton wrote this poem. You may have heard it before. It's very short. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way. But left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word she had said she. But oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. See, I can learn a lot by realizing what my sin has done and the sorrow that that causes in my heart. I've sinned against my God. And I mourn over that. And when I humble myself and mourn over that and I take my sin seriously, then I can find comfort. That's when God says, Child, you can be comforted. There's forgiveness full and free if you will just come to me. Two questions. Number one, when's the last time you mourned over your sin? When's the last time you mourned over your sin? Or have you gotten in the habit of dismissing it or making light of it? Number two, do you long for comfort and happiness in this life? Because Jesus said in Matthew 5, that the path to comfort and happiness comes through mourning over your sin because then that's where you find restoration and forgiveness. Boy, peace comes when I'll just do what the Lord wants me to do. But if I fight and scratch and claw and try to go my own way, I'm asking for nothing but trouble. There's no peace there. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. You've never humbled yourself and confessed your sins before God. Today you can and we'd love to show you how you can know for sure. Maybe you're a Christian here today and it's been a long time since you mourned over your sin. And please, I hope you understand, I'm not trying to drag anybody down to this altar. But I want to help you. I want to pray with you. I want to see you understand the comfort that comes when you confess your sins before your God. What a great, great life that is. Let's bow, please, for prayer. Lord, please, help us to be found certainly humbling ourselves, but Lord, mourning over our sin, taking our sin seriously, and realizing, Lord, that I... I can't do anything to bring comfort in my life. I can't erase or blot out the sins in my own life. Only you can do that. And so, Lord, those thoughts that I have, those actions and attitudes that I have on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, Lord, please help me to take those things seriously and not just excuse them or even make light of grace by continuing in them. Lord, help me be pleased to be found mourning my sin, taking it seriously, because then you said, you promised there's comfort there. And Lord, we'll thank you for the help that you give. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're ready for baptism, you can go now and, and we'll be ready just for baptism right at the end of our invitation. But maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ, your personal Savior. Maybe you've never understood that you're a sinner, but that Christ wants to give you, give you salvation if you'll come and humble yourself before Him. Today you can know that. You're here today and no one's looking around. Just between you and me and the Lord, of course. You just lay for here long enough for me to see it. Preacher, would you pray for me? I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I don't know that I have forgiveness of sins. Anyone at all, you'd just be honest enough to lift your hand long enough for me to see it. Put it right back down. Preacher, would you pray for me? I don't know for sure that I'm saved. Anyone at all? Preacher, pray. I'm not certain that I'm saved. Anyone at all? All right, then Christian, how about you? When have you mourned over your sin? Do you take it seriously? Do you understand the separation that it brings between you and your God? When's the last time you humbled yourself before God and said, Lord, I'm sorry, I agree with you about this. And then rest in His forgiveness and the comfort that He gives. In just a moment, we're going to pray. We'll stand to our feet. Whether you raised your hand or you didn't, you need to come forward. The altar is open.
Whatever the need, the Lord speaks, obey the Lord and come. Lord, please help them in a time of invitation. Strengthen Christians, help them please to take this matter seriously. Not that we don't have fun or enjoy the Christian life, that's not what we're saying at all. But Lord, there comes a time in our life when we need to take things seriously. So please help us, if it's been a long time, Please help us to make that decision. And Lord, maybe there's someone here today that didn't raise their hand. Maybe they were embarrassed or didn't know what they needed to do. And Lord, help them today, this morning, to come. Help us to show them from your word how they can know for sure their sins are forgiven and they have a home in heaven for eternity. Lord, you want to give that to them by grace. Help them to make that decision. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.